Hello and welcome to Recruiter 360 TV with me, Toby Babb, and delighted to be joined today by Ashley Rice. Ashley, how are you? Morning, Toby. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good to see you. Very good, thanks. Very good. So, a long career in recruitment. Yes. Now moving over to the uh, L&D side of things a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us a little bit about your background and what you're doing now. So, 16 years in recruitment, so 10 years with the big corporate haze technology. Started back in 2001, just after, um, just after 9-11, actually, so it's a tough, tough kind of intro into the yeah. recruitment world. Um, but I had a great time, of ha- great time at Hayes, as I say, 10 year career there. Um, at one point I was running multiple offices across, across the country, 60, 70 con- consultants. Then um, uh, I moved from there to a, to a small niche recruitment business that just focused on kind of risk and, and governance market down in, um, down in the city. And I spent, spent five years there. Yeah, yeah. I had a great time there. Um, did, lots of, um, did lots of stuff in terms of diversifying the business. I suppose the bit I really enjoyed was the kind of people development side. and I. Um, I put us through uh, investors in people. You know, yeah. Good showing on that on the first, um, the first, the, the first outing, and then also as well, we went through some of the times top one, top one hundred places to work, and I think it was fourth we came actually in the, wow. in the first showing there. So, so yeah, over those four or five years, I spent a lot of time developing the management team, and also as well, I focused a lot on developing new people that came into the business. So, um, I suppose I took that one stage further, and I qualified as a coach with the International Coaching Federation. And then decided that actually that was what I wanted to do. That's what I was, what I loved. That's what I was passionate about. Yeah. So now I go out and I help grow through recruitment businesses, build capability in their their management team. So you know, using my experience into some kind of mentoring work, but also um, using my coaching coaching skills and, and training as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm loving it. You're loving life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> loving life. Yeah. Well, you're going into a really interesting area, aren't you? Because. Um, it's uh, it, it, you know, it's commonly seen as one of the the, the sort of problems of the recruitment industry that bottleneck yeah. where where companies grow quickly. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them are developing their own uh, management teams. It's seen as one of the hardest jobs in recruitment to sort of first come into that sort of job and, and start building on some instances and also managing at the same sort of stage. You're seeing people there who might not necessarily be the right people in leadership stage teams yeah, at certain yeah. stages. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you've learned and what you th- you feel the industry can improve on in terms of developing leadership within. Recruitment. Yeah, I think over the last twelve month, I've worked with with six or seven recruitment businesses and a couple of tech businesses actually, and they they both suffer from similar kind of um, similar kind of issues. So they they, they grow really quickly mm-hmm. um, at sort of that three to five year stage. They get to about fifteen to twenty people. All of a sudden, they realise well, we need a leadership team mm-hmm. actually to, to if we, if we want to grow any further and to to scale the business. So what tends to happen is. Um, they take all their best bidders and they make them managers because obviously they're the best at what what they do, um, which is kind of natural, I suppose. But but what they don't do is necessarily work out whether actually they've got the right motivations and the right kind of competencies and behaviours to be a manager because it's a totally different job, right? Being mm-hmm. a consultant to a manager. Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not a football fan, but from what I understand, it's very different being a good football player to being a good manager. Yeah, completely yeah. different skills. Yeah. Okay. So. Nobody really takes that into account. Then they, they give people a, a leadership role, a management role on a team, and they don't give them the kind of the, the, the tools and investment and training and support and development that they need to actually be able to do the job to the best of their ability. So what tends to happen is they spend half their life in, in, in meetings, um, and they also struggle to motivate and develop their team. So yeah. you have maybe four or five managers in a business, and they're just struggling to scale, struggling to, to, to retain good people. Um, and I see that a lot. So a lot of the leadership teams that I'm working with have been, maybe they've got six months, they've been in a leadership position to, to 12 months, two years, but they all suffer the same kind of issues in the fact that they don't know what they don't know. So mm. the basics around some, some kind of management frameworks and rigor around, you know, um, how they use maybe data to manage people, you know, both qualitative and, and, and quantitative. They lack consistency. Mm. They don't invest time in training people because it's a tough job, right? Being a billing manager, you know, you still got to bill 15, 20 grand a month. And yeah. um, also as well, you've got two or three, two or three people that you need to actually yeah. train. And yeah. I think that organisation of time, right? Yeah, they struggle. People struggle to um, balance the time doing their day job plus also, plus also doing the management role. And, you know, the two key things in the management role are, are, are kind of building ability and motivating your mm. team. That's basically what job performance is, a multiple of ability, time motivation. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, there's some there's some big big gaps in there, and it's never really the manager's fault. It's usually the fact that, as I say, they don't know what they don't know, yeah. and they haven't had the training. And I suppose that's where I come in is to help them be better at what they do and more yeah. more capable, and then they enjoy their job more and they're more successful. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thing there, you talk about the, the, the sort of traits of a, a, a great biller and a great manager sometimes mm. not being the same. Obviously there are, there are great billers who become great managers and yeah. I think there's an importance to have been good at your job to be able to tell people how to do it as yes. well as one alongside that. Yeah. So, um, so tell me what you've identified, having seen a number of different people and obviously a, a significant amount of time in the industry, what are these, the sort of identifiers of a good recruitment manager? Um, I think you have to be you have to be fairly organised. You have to be process driven. Um, you can't be selfish because actually you need to look after the people who are working for you ahead of yourself. And some top billers are, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. They're they're innately actually it's it's about yeah, it's yeah. about me and yeah. you know I want still want to be the top biller and you, you kind of have to have to let go of that. Yeah. Um, so the people that I see who are, who are more successful have gone into it for the for the right reasons. That actually yeah. they. They, they have a passion for and they enjoy working with people and seeing them develop and helping them develop and, yeah. and grow. Um, so you have to, it's people who have, who've let go of their ego slightly and yeah. said actually, do you know what, I'm not going to be the top biller now. Yeah. Um, or certainly if my team scales, I'm not going to be yeah. the top biller. Um, but yeah, I think you have to be organised, you have to be consistent, you have to be process driven, yeah. you have to be prepared to give some of your to give some of your time, time for it. Yeah, yeah there's absolutely. an interesting thing, isn't there, about that? Because uh, you know, I've, I've I've seen this as well for a you know, similar. I think it was in, in the industry um, the year before you you, know, you start you started, and it was that it's 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 been a an amazing sort of thing to see some people who do it in various different ways. So you have your people there who commit themselves, you know, fully and, and do say, right, I'm going to sacrifice myself for the good of the team. Yeah. Which is a big move to, you know, to make. And oh, obviously, yeah. yeah. Obviously it can go uh, really well in the longer, longer term for their career. It's sort of uh, self-interest, but, but you know, in, in some ways and not in others. There are also people there who say, right, I'm going to be the top biller yeah. and I'm going to take my team with me who are going to copy me and then become second and third off the, off the back of that and, yeah. and do it through that competitive nature. Have you seen that work as well? You talk about leading by example. Leading by example, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us talk about co- you know, uh, coaching and, and the death side thing and spending yeah. time with people. Just as effective sometimes, I think, are the people, and, and this is something which I think sometimes is missing actually from the industry, yeah. is where managers take it and say, right, follow me, and they're not there and, and sort of hand feeding people and, yeah. and doing that. But they're saying, look, here is a great example of what you've got to do. Yeah. I'm going to set this out, I'm going to hold you to account for not doing it alongside me, and let's go on this together, yeah. and that, that sort of journey. It isn't, right, I'm going to do this, focus on myself, and, and not bother about you. It's a slightly different, it's a nuanced yeah. area of it. But um, I think sometimes it's underplayed a little bit when I, when I look at recruitment training. That that thing that's missing sometimes is the the absolute necessity to set the pace of the team. Yeah, and I think that is fundamentally still really important that the manager yeah. does set the pace of the team and they do lead by example, but you, that's not enough to take people with you. Yeah, yeah. You need yeah. other tools yeah, absolutely. In, um, to, to, be able to, to be able to do that. Just because you lead does not mean to say that people are following, you've got to lead in the right way. Yeah. Okay? But you know, it's really important. Aspirational that, and inspirational role modeling effect, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and that is, that is part of the kind of tool set that you yeah. need as a, as a manager and as a, as a leader. Um, but as as your team grows, it might be that you lead by different in in terms of in different ways. So it might not be actually you can then but you're billing 20, 30, 40 grand a month. It might be actually you know you're leading from the front in terms of actually you are going out and you're winning you're winning business. Or it might be that you go out and you're taking your taking your guys out on meetings and upskilling them, yeah. them that way. As long as people can see that actually you're doing something and it's adding adding value yeah. to the team and to the business, then that's what it's about. What they do, what people don't like is seeing a manager sat there doing behind spreadsheets all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. they're expecting them to get on the phone and yeah. make you know, X amount of calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're sat there on a spreadsheet. That's what yeah. is the opposite of, of good good leadership. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's getting that balance. And again, that's that's difficult. And I think that's where the kind of coaching comes in yeah. to help you to get that get that balance. The, uh, the spreadsheet is the refrain of uh, a number of different managers, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> evil. it's absolutely evil. I think it's, Excel's got a lot to answer for <laughs> and they should just ban it from all... Um, from all consultants' PCs, I think there's a place for it, but not, yeah. not necessarily with managers. And you've got some great tools out there now, you know, yeah. like Cube 19, which I'm a massive fan of. Likewise, yeah. um, you've got North Star, which um, I'm, I'm working with a client now who's using that, which yeah. is actually a blend of, you know, being able to use the data to drive the business, plus also as well, it's, it's really good at um, actually helping managers 
manage the objectives that they, they set with people each month in their monthly reviews. There's some, there's some great tools out there um, that you can use that link directly to your, to your CRM. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a place for those kind of things. But, you, you but know, making it part of the job as opposed to all of which yeah, I guess is all, right of this, all of what we're saying so far, yeah. isn't it? Use the right ones and use them to, to, to drive the right behaviour. Yeah. Cube's amazing at being able to, 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 to analyse you know, quantitatively what you're doing, but also be able to work out the quality of what you're doing by, yeah. by using some really simple ratios. And you see, that that's that's a really important part of management in, in my own mind, particularly around data, because yeah. uh, you know, when, you, when you're when you looking at data and you're using it the right way, something like, you know, we, we use Cube19 extensively, and you've got, you've got to use it as... as, as, as Cube19. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to use it as, a, as um, performance science, right, as yeah. opposed to a KPI stick. And as yeah. long as you're looking into it and diving into, uh, you know, Pure, purely KPI based numbers sitting in a spreadsheet looking at who's done what, Johnny's done this and Jessica's done that. Yeah. If you're not looking at what that what the story behind those numbers is and where those CVs are going or where those interviews are yeah. at and what sort of like trends in that and that, then you're not using technology right. And I see a lot of management in my mind just look at the at the at the veneer of it. Yeah. And it's so much more what's behind that surface that Yeah. You know, look, it's about it's about a manager using quantitative and qualitative data to drive yeah. their business, right? And use it to make tactical decisions. Yeah. Okay, but also use it to make longer term decisions in in terms of the, the the quality of what they're doing. Okay, so I could walk into any business and I could look at three key metrics: CVs, interviews, jobs. Yeah. Right. Okay, for me, and they're not KPIs. What I try and get managers to understand is that what is what does good look like? Yeah. For those, for those out, I call them outputs those three outputs yeah. okay how do they link you, you want to do two million quid this year across your business okay yeah. so what do you need to do to achieve that yeah. okay let's break it down and let's look at what we need to do and then let's look at okay so what are the ratios that sit below that cv to first interview first interview to placement for me those are key to managing your team yeah because industry standard i'm seeing is it's two cvs to a first interview mm -hmm. okay and i'm seeing anything between five and seven first interviews to a job so mm -hmm. if those are out of kilter then Use that to look at the quality of what you're doing. Okay, there's only two ways to drive fees: you either do more of what you're doing, or you do it better. Mm. Yeah, and I include, you know, average fees. Um, you know, charging more, a, bit, a bigger percentage, or um, you know, moving up the food chain in terms of roles as, as, as the quality aspect. So there's only there's only two things that you can do, and you need to know the data, and you need to know what good looks like in order to be able to use that. Yeah, okay, yeah. but I think fundamentally, you, you can manage a team. You can manage a region. You can manage a whole business using those three key metrics. Yeah. Right? yeah. If I walk into your, if I walk to your sales floor now, yeah. and I said, "All right, guys, how many forward first interviews have you got?" Mm -hmm. And it was ten. Mm -hmm. I would think the sixty consultants out there. Mm. Well, actually, that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, yeah. My next question yeah. would obviously be, "How many CVs you've got outstanding?" Yeah. Yeah. And these are all numbers and all data. And actually, I don't know what good looks like. Probably with sixty consultants, maybe a hundred. Yeah. If your forward first interviews drop below a hundred, you might go. Yeah. What's happening, guys? Yeah. Yeah. And then you use your, your recruitment bank to trace it back. Okay. Yeah. So, well, we haven't got many CVs outstanding. Yeah. How many jobs have you got on? Yeah. Not many. Yeah. Take out and get some more jobs, or yeah. you know, go back and, and requalify and flex the jobs we've got. So, yeah. it's getting managers to use all the skills that they've already got and everything they've learned, yeah. but in a bit more of a kind of structured, structured way. Structured, yeah. Using these using these amazing tools that we've got yeah. these days. It's really interesting actually, when, you know, when, we, when, we, when I asked that question, you said structure and organisation was probably one of the first things that came to mind for yeah. you. It is, it is amazing how often um, systematic processes and structure comes up in, in conversation with high performance in, in leadership. So that can be anything, that can be business, that can be sport, that can be military. Yeah. You have this sort of image of, of, a, of a, a man great manager or a great leader being the orator and the inspirate, you know, the inspirate, inspirer, the the you know the uh, the big Churchillian sort of uh, speeches, etc., yeah. etc. But actually, it's a it's a an organisation and, and process that generally pr creates great results, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because, but again, one without the other is no good. You know, it's, yeah. if you if you know how to do something but nobody wants to follow you, yeah, then it's kind of useless yeah, and yeah. E equally the other way around if you're incredibly charismatic and everybody thinks you're a you're, you know you're a great guy or a great girl and they love going to the pub with you and they'll jump into a ditch but they, yeah. nobody's got any, any idea about, <laughs> yeah. you know one of, the, one of the biggest problems i find is that managers don't objective set and review and if you look at there's a, there's a guy called peter drucker i don't know if he's still alive yeah. but he he's kind of yeah. a godfather of modern management and the yeah. first thing he said is a responsibility of a manager not a leader but a manager is to objective set yeah okay the objective set in a smart way and then objectives need to be reviewed right yeah because if they're not reviewed then they get devalued and people don't actually do what they say they're going to yeah. do 
but actually, if, I, I find quite a lot of managers don't do those basic things. Or do it in, in, a, in an MBR or whatever it might be, and yes, then sit, 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 sit there and uh, then say, look, we haven't done that a month later when it's in the next, next sort of play. That's the bit that gets me. It's about yeah. making sure that there is management all the way through the month. You, you set a plan and you look at that plan and create habits around that performance to allow it to happen. Yeah. It shouldn't be a surprise at the end of the month saying, well, we haven't done all of that. It's got to be uh, consistent all the way through. Right? And that's where I believe you know managers need to manage and, and quite a lot of people, they'll say to me, yeah, I don't like micromanaging. Yeah. I'm not, okay, so what's, what does micromanaging mean to you? So if you have a five minute check-in with your, with your consultant in the morning and they, you, they know what they're doing, how much they need to do and how to do it, yeah. Yeah? then you check in with them at lunchtime, how did your morning go? How did you get on? And then maybe check in again with them in the evening. Is that micromanagement? And I'm talking about managing that's potentially a trainee or somebody with six months' experience. Yeah. Well, do I really need to check in with them three times a day? Yeah. We're talking maybe 15, 20 minutes. And in those check ins, you're, you're making sure they know what they need to do, how to do it. It's an opportunity for you to train them, and coach yeah. them. And actually, they feel like you're taking an interest in them. So yeah. that's called management. Yeah. It's not micromanagement. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I think it's, again, people. Sometimes get scared of managing. Yeah. And also as well, I see that, that the more senior that people become, the less managers manage them. Yeah. We go into a lot of businesses and senior consultants are just left to get on with it. Yeah. And okay, they probably can and they could build their 250, 300 a year, but actually they you can still add value to that person. Yeah, absolutely, you can yeah. still help them, you can they'll still they can still benefit from your advice and structure and they're not going to progress and Human nature is that people do want to progress. They do want to get better. Yeah. They don't want to end the year the same as they were the year before. It's a manager's responsibility to, to do to that. To improve everyone all the time. Though. motivation where you see a lot of senior consultants leave because yeah. they're like, yeah, my manager doesn't care. Well, they do care, yeah. actually. They're scared of managing because yeah. they're like, well, they're billing more than me now, so yeah. what can they learn off well, me? This is one of the sort of developments of, uh, of recent leadership and recent business, isn't it? It's... Uh, um, I think it probably is a little bit of Steve Jobs to blame for. He says, "Look, hire great people, get out of their way, and let them do it." Yeah. Now, that's been misinterpreted in my imagine, you know, my my view. And people there who are good at the job say, "Well, just leave me to it. I know what I'm doing." It's irresponsible. It's an irresponsible play. There is a difference between sort of guiding and being a. You know, I love the, the phrase of the light hand on the tiller. Yeah. Uh, which is effectively where it is. And as long as people are pointing that direction, and helping people to. Stay in the bowling lane with the be the be the buffers to allow the you know to, the, the strike to happen at the end. It's a really really important aspect, and I think look, yes, you, you, you do manage new starters differently than you manage people who've had a year or two differently to how you manage your, your senior yeah. people. But you're in a business because you know rather than doing it on, your, on yourself because you want to be improved and you want to move things, and and uh, a management can't be afraid you know, afraid of that. I don't think people can sit there and say right, okay, I can't put myself into it. I personally. Would always have an issue when someone talks to me about coming into an interview saying I'm leaving my last business because there's a KPI culture. Mm. Now, KPI culture, whichever business you're in in recruitment, as far as I'm concerned, is whether the, whether people talk about KPIs or don't have KPIs, you yeah. still have that in action. Is it? So, for me, numbers tell a story, data tells a story. Yeah. Okay, and it's actually being able to use that to manage your business effectively. Like yeah. as I say, you know, if you're not if you're not doing enough, then you're not utilising the, the, the resources that you've got, so you, you need to do more, which is data-driven. Um, if you're not doing it well enough, you need to understand what you're not doing well enough, and yeah. actually you can use the data, the ratios, to, to understand that, and then take, take tactical action to, to remedy that, which might be, okay, well, well actually, our first interview to placement ratio is really low. Why is that? What can we do about it? You know, in the business I worked in before, our, our seeding to first interview ratio was four to one. Yeah. You know, that's across per contract and the delivery team. That's yeah. quite high. Fundamentally, yeah. seventy-five percent of your time yeah. is unproductive. Yeah. But all of the managers had CV twenty relate ratios of less than two to one. Yeah. Some are one point five. So, in a, a management meeting, I said to the guys, that this is where we are. This is where you guys are. What do you think we can do to bring that ratio down over yeah. time?" Yeah. And the it's answer a double was, your money play, right? Yeah, it's a we'll, we'll check all the CVs before they go out. And that yeah. sounds really draconian and micromanagement, yeah. but actually, over time, over three months, they were all three month rolling averages, I see the interview ratio went down from four to one to three to one. Yeah. It okay, continued to drop just yeah. by identifying using the numbers yeah. and then doing something yeah. sensible about it. So That's the thing, what's your problem and how are you going to fix it? That's yeah. that's the way you want to do it. It's the yeah. story, story behind the numbers. Yeah, exactly. And KPIs are 
are always going people are always going to have issues with KPIs and I think it's sometimes how people contextualize the numbers and say well actually do you understand the link and there's there's the money there's the placements do you understand what you need to do to get those placements yeah. and that's what KPIs are yeah I don't believe in giving managers um, senior consultants KPIs but I do believe in them understanding what they need to do in terms of output CVs to, 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 yeah. to be able to, to build a 20 30 grand a, yeah. a month um, you know I think you need to yeah, as I say, the numbers tell a story. Yeah, and I think that's really important. Yeah. Well, look, listen, the, the, we've we've touched only a fraction of the the whole yes. complexity of what uh, it takes to be a great manager in recruitment. Maybe we can bring you back on another show to uh, to dive into all the other wealth of knowledge that you've got. Um, I've got one more question for you yeah. before we before we time out. Um, if you could give one bit of advice to someone, what would that advice be? Love what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually now that's quite synonymous with WeWork because they say yeah. do what you love. Yeah. But actually that comes from a, a song that was released in two thousand and one. Actually, the year that I first got into recruitment by Divine Comedy called Love What You Love What You Do. Yeah. And it really resonated with me at the time because obviously I changed changed career and, yeah. and when I first got into recruitment it was so exciting. Yeah. And yeah, I loved it and and that kind of resonated. And then you know I've listened back to it over the years and it's I, I think the lyrics go. If you if you want it, I'm, ho- I'm hoping you're going to sing it for me. If yeah, I'm, I'm not quite as good as you. Okay, you know, like if you if you want it, you can have it. If you need it, go and get it. Yeah. Whatever it takes, you've got to love what you do. Yeah. And I just think, for me, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think it's it's um there was a quote I heard uh, a couple of years ago that resonated with me, which is which is you can't always do what you love, but you can, you can always love what you do. And I see so many people. Um, come into this and, and either choose to be ambivalent towards their career in recruitment and some people come in there and absolutely just fall in love with it. Yeah. I've been really fortunate I think over 19 years to be as, as passionate about the industry as I was when I first got into it as I am today. I think it's a great industry, I think there's so many different nuances and, yeah. and elements to it and, 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 and when you're in love with what you do I think you can do great, great things. So absolutely, I 100% yeah. echo what, you, what you're saying and uh, and thanks for sharing it with us. No worries, thanks David. Actually, great to meet you, great to have you in, in today. Thanks very much, um, enjoyed it. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, have a look at my website, which is um, arpd.co.uk, uh, all my contact details are on there. Love to come out and have a coffee and a chat with anybody who wants to talk about um, developing capability in their, in their leadership team. Great stuff. Well, listen, thanks to all of you for watching. Hope you've got some uh, sage wisdom from it, and we'll see you on soon on another episode of Recruiter 360 TV. Thanks for watching.